This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks, Neil. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I'll thank Neil for being such a great host. Uh, and it's good to see him again, and it's good to see him thriving here. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. I've, uh, it's, it doesn't seem like spring here. <laughs> it's 82 degrees today in Sacramento. That's a little too warm for us. But, uh, it's a pleasure to be here nonetheless, and, uh, it's, and it's also uh, this symposia thing, uh, Lee Lang and, and Terrence put it together. Uh, it's it's uh, nicknamed the Old Farts Symposium because it's supposed to be a bunch of, a bunch of us tree crop physiologists who, who are in the process of retiring in the, in the somewhat either already retired or in the, in, in the relatively near future retiring. And uh, I did get my degree in, in, in at Davis, but it was in the botany department. And my PhD was in beech and dune plant ecology. So I, w I, I never did have a formal course in pomology or horticulture in my life, but now I'm the primary uh, pomology instructor at Davis. So life is full of fun. Uh, and I really enjoyed my career uh, in, in tree fruit physiology. I look, at, I look at the pomology as basically applied environmental physiology uh, with trees. And I'm, uh, today I'm going to talk about work that we've done uh, with uh, <coughs> rootstock physiology work primarily. Uh, I spent a lot of my time doing crop modeling, tree crop modeling, and a whole bunch of other sort of things. I'll talk about that uh, on, on Wednesday uh, of this week at the Geneva meeting. So I thought I'd do something a little different here today. Um, and uh, about 30 years ago now, um, Scott Johnson and myself uh, teamed up with a, a USDA scientist who had been collecting potentially dwarfing rootstocks for peach. Uh, Scott Johnson actually was a graduate from Cornell. He's one of uh, Alan Laxo's early PhD students. And he's the extension specialist at Kearney, at the Kearney Ag Center, which is in the, in the Central Valley of California. He and I have done a lot of work together. And uh, we, we uh, started looking at these rootstocks and, and, and the, our, our typical, for these are all, I'm going to talk about peach exclusively today. Uh, our standard peach rootstock in California is Nemigard. It's a very vigorous rootstock selected for uh, root knot nematode resistance and, and vigor. Our growers are interested in having a much, or having some size reduction and less pruning costs and so on. So we, we began looking at some of these selections. Uh, from that program, we started out with uh, 122 different accessions of genotypes. Uh, we've narrowed, and we, we got about 82 of those to root from hardwood cuttings. And from that, we narrowed it down to, to 10. That looked reasonably good. And then we finally ended up with these two, controller 9 and con what are called controller 9 and controller 5 here. And this Hiawatha is an old rootstock from South Dakota. But they all had some dwarfing. So this is the, the, uh, the trunk circumferences. And you can see there's some dwarfing after 12 years. Um, and this is the standard open base tree. These are perpendicular V or a V-shaped tree. They also, you, and consistently with two different tops, two different signs. So the, the trees aren't tremendously smaller, but this is Nemigard uh, or uh, uh, Lodell peach on Nemigard, and this is the one on controller nine. This is controller five. The size of the trees isn't that much smaller, but the openness of the trees is much greater. And we have much less response to pruning when we prune these two as opposed to this. As you can see here, this is some of the, from the early, again, two different, uh, two different tops and two different training systems. Uh, and consistently, 
this is the, the dry mass of the, of the dormant prunings. Well, actually, some are in dormant prunings to put together. And you can see the difference in the pruning weight is quite significant. Uh, subsequent to that early study, uh, Fred Bliss came to Davis and started looking at additional crosses. And the uh, Harrow blood by Okinawa, Okinawa cross was, uh, was really, uh, really through a lot of variation in, in uh, size controlling potential. And so we released uh, four more rootstocks in addition to the in, uh, initial two. The, the initial two are controller nine and controller five. Controller five, it's, the tree's actually almost too small and it produces small fruit. So we don't, want, we don't want dwarf fruit when we have a dwarf tree, but these others are all producing uh, reasonable, I mean, yeah, reasonably sized fruit compared to trees on Nemegard. And so uh, we, so we've re yeah, released all of these six and these numbers basically represent something relative to the size of Nemegard. So this should be about 95%, so just slightly reducing 90, 95%, 80%, 70%, 60%, more or less, and 50% of trees on Nemegard. So while we did all that sort of evaluation sorts of work, as a physiologist, I got more and more interested in, in the dwarfing mechanism. And so I'm gonna talk mainly about that. And so way back in 1939, looking at Molly 9 and some of the mauling rootstocks, Beak Payne and, and Thompson, Beak Bain, they were both at uh, East Mauling. Uh, they an analyzed the anatomy uh, of the xylem and, and phloem and so on in, in uh, the dwarfing ap apple rootstocks. And they, they showed that the cross-sectional area, uh, the xylem cross-sectional area uh, the various apple rootstocks composed of fibrous parenchyma and vessel rays, and the percent of fibers and vessels were proportional to the vigor of the rootstocks imparted to the scion. And the more uh, dwarfing rootstocks had smaller vessels than vigorous rootstocks. Uh, and, but, well, then they concluded that at least a partial explanation of the mechanism of rootstock effect may be obtained from a study of internal structure of the fruit trees. They were very cautious about assigning any causal relationship between uh, uh, xylem vessel characteristics of the rootstock versus a sign uh, to the dwarfing. And the reason for that is summarized in this review, which is an annual review of plant physiology by, by Rogers and Beekbane. And, and so the, at that, in that review, they said that there were basically three potential mechanisms to explain sign rootstock interactions. One was nutrient, uh, may differ greatly in the capacity for absorbing, storing, and utilizing nutrients. One was in transport, focused on the phloem transport, but acknowledged the differences in sizing and size and numbers of vessels are sufficient to su suggest that the capacity of the xylem for water transport would be higher and vigorous than in dwarf plants, but this may not be a limiting factor based on the view that the number of vessels in the stems is normally greatly in excess of that required to transport water. So as you know, we have lots and lots of xylem area in trees, and so they basically said, well, it doesn't make sense that this can actually be a limiting factor because in general, we think that there's excess xylem capacity. And then the one related to, to, to uh, growth regulating substance, substances, which basically has been sort of the principal uh, mechanism that's been bandied around for the rest, for the last 60 years. So uh, I had a graduate student uh, in the 90s, late 90s, who basically described uh, some of these early rootstocks that we're looking at and what their growth characteristics were. We had, uh, and basically, uh, the, new, the peach rootstocks are affected or limited shoot length growth. That is, uh, and that was basically the inner node lengths, but not the number of nodes. And trunk girth, 
was, was decreased in the number, as we saw already in the previous slide, or the slides ago, and the number of, and length of, of water sprouts, the epicormic shoots uh, tended to be less with the, with the size controlling rootstocks. And uh, there was a hint that the trees on dwarfing rootstocks had no lower, uh, uh, more, more negative midday stem water potentials. So based on that work, uh, that early the descriptive work, um, and on a study that I, a previous student of mine did, uh, we showed that shoot extension growth is, is a linear function of the temperature and, late, and the rate of the change of, of stem water potential in, in, in peaches. Now, uh, this is a little bit counterintuitive because uh, before you look at that, so what time of day is, is shoot growth the greatest? Shoot extension growth. What type of day is shoot extension growth the greatest in a fruit tree? Early in the morning. Early in the morning, why? Because the, uh, because the water potential is Water high. potential is the highest, yep. Okay, anybody else want to guess? Why? Yeah, you got sugar accumulation, yeah. All right, so it turns out that uh, contrary to the water, water hypothesis, afternoon is the, is the period of most rapid stem extension growth. So this is the, this is the, the extension growth rate here, and you see that uh, it, its peak is about six, uh, six o'clock, 1,800 hours. Most people, because they're so fixated on water relations, immediately talk about, think about the, mid, the, the dawn water potential being the driver. But in fact, the temperature, temperature is, is one of the most significant factors ever driving growth. And the availability of carbohydrates. Lei Lang is focused on carbohydrates, so that's involved there. But anyway, we could, we, we could uh, basically model this stem extension growth rate as a function, a linear function of, of um, the, recovery, the recovery of water potential from the midday low. The rate of recovery of water potential from the midday low plus the temperature. Uh, and so we got a fairly good regression of that. Well, so under, really realizing that or understanding that, I went back and we thought, okay, let's take a look at these rootstocks in the field. So we did this experiment with Nemigard, Hiawatha, and uh, K14643, which is controller five now. Um, and and this range, this is a range of uh, size reduction. And sure enough, we did this, uh, we did these diurnal patterns of, sh of extension growth rate, uh, relative extension growth rate, and and stem mid uh, and stem water potential over the day. And sure enough, the, the most size controlling had the most negative uh, minimum water potential and so forth. And, and as the spring warmed up, that those differences, especially with the, with the uh, controller of five or the K14643 was much negative, more negative. And, and this was as the spring kept going. But then as, as you end up in June, the differences became a little bit less. But we're, so when we put that all together, we, we came up with this sort of integrated daily stem uh, fluctuation in, in megapascals per hour. And uh, the, the, the K14643 was, was the most affected, or the, the, uh, had the lowest integrated uh, water potential fluctuation, and then the Hiawatha in between, and then guard here. So it uh, convinced us that yes, indeed, the water relations thing is something going on with water relations. And this is this is the water sprout length or epicormic shoot length uh, in those same trees that we were looking at this other, and this is the accumulated integrated stem fluctuation. And we uh, we again a very good relationship. 
the length of water sprouts, which grow sort of indeterminately through the whole season, and this and this uh, and uh, and water and 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 stem water potential. So then I. Um, so we were now fairly convinced that water potential had something to do with it. Uh, then I had another student, Luis Solari, uh, and we decided, okay, in order to nail this down, we should, we should manipulate water potential. So what we did was, uh, or what he sh did, I should say, you know, professors, faculty always say we, but it's really the student that does all the work. Uh, <laughs> Nevertheless, I'll continue to say we. Uh, anyway, what he what we did what he did was he wrapped the the shoot to stop the transpiration, and then put this this sort of uh, insulating this is like a space blanket material over the top, and so that the shoots didn't heat up. And we, and he either he either covered zero, thirty percent, or sixty percent of the canopy with this with this material. Uh, <clears throat> in the evening before a warm summer day. <clears throat> and the idea here it was to see whether we could manipulate water potential and get, get a range of water potentials and still see this change in, in, in uh, stem extension growth rate. So basically by doing and on he did that on the three rootstocks. So Nemagard, Hiawatha, and K146 or Controller 5. And you see f immediately that the, this is the uh, stem water potential, and always uh, the, the more dwarf rootstock had a lower water potential. We, but we could indeed raise that water potential by covering 30 or 60 percent of the canopy, uh, and so that we had basically overlapping water potentials uh, between the Nemagard and the and the. Uh, Hiawatha and 146.43. And when we did that, we, this is the relative stem extension growth rate, and then we get a corresponding overlap in stem extension growth rate. So there's a direct correlation uh, on the three rootstocks, three different rootstocks uh, directly related to water potential. So, uh, uh, and this, this shows the relationship uh, more clearly as a graph with all the, with all the points on it, differing amounts of cover of coverage and so forth, all put together. So there 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 appears to be a direct relationship of that. So then, <coughs> and then uh, when that experiment was done with those small trees, he uh, we we used a um, a uh, hydraulic pressure. Uh, machine to measure to measure specific hydraulic conductance of of the plant of the of the shoot the root and uh, or the shoot part and the root part and then put them together the whole tree <coughs> so basically what, what you do is you cut the tree off you measure the hydraulic conductance of the upper part and then you turn the thing around and put it on the root and force the water backwards through there uh, there's a little bit of Concern about forcing whether forcing water backward through the root is the right thing to do, but nevertheless, you still get you still get these differences. So, assuming that the, the differences would be relative, you see that when there's no difference uh, between uh, the treatments with the cyan, so all of these had the same uh, the same cyan on top, same peach cyan on top. I forgot exactly what it was, but they're all the same, but they're just on different rootstocks. Uh, but the rootstock consistently had uh, Nemagard, the root of Nemagard had a, a, a higher specific hydraulic, leaf specific hydraulic conductance. Uh, the, and so the, the difference was in the rootstock, not in the cyan. Uh, and then the student, uh, that wasn't quite enough for him. So we did this additional experiment where we put the, the plants in these, these chambers. We grew the plants in the chambers for a number of years. He had a whole slew of other ones that he did some other experiments. But the, these chambers, you're able to, we're able to uh, seal them up and, and apply uh, pressure, air pressure, to the bottom while they're, while they're uh, growing. 
and we, we moved them to a growth chamber and did this work. And, um, and this kind of work has been done before with other plants. It, it, sort of, it sort of documents that yes, water potential actually works and, and the system as we think of it actually works. You apply pressure to the to rootstock or to the roots and you, it, you can indeed, as you apply pressure, the leaf water potential of the, of, of the cyan uh, changes proportionally. So you apply pressure and the root, and the root stock water, I mean the cyan water potential increases. It maintain the difference between the, the two root stocks. So in this case, we just had two, the Nemegard versus the controller five or K14643. And, and so the, the more negative one is the, is the controller five or the dwarfing rootstock, and the other one is the vigorous rootstock. So the, so the relative extension, uh, and, the, and this is the corresponding relative extension growth rate of these rootstocks, I mean of the shoots. So again, we can manipulate the water potential and we, by doing so, we manipulate the shoot extension growth rate. So the sort of, nails it in terms of yes indeed um, the rate of growth or the rate of stem extension growth on the rootstock is directly related to water water relations and and he also measured then the the uh, the hydraulic conductance again least specific hydraulic conductance of these two and and again the cyan not really well in this case slightly different but not a whole lot different but the, but the rootstock is where most of the difference was between here and here. Uh, so then I had this, this visiting scientist from Italy came and, um, and he said, you know, you've done all this stuff. I read all your papers and it would be interesting to look at the xylem anatomy. I said, well, certainly it can't be that easy. This whole thing can't be that simple. Uh, but uh, he went, went ahead and he, he measured uh, the xylem vessel characteristics and, and then calculated axial hydraulic conductance of the size, of the size controlling rootstocks. And in this case, he did Nemegard and uh, the controller nine and controller five. Uh, and sure enough, he got differences in, in the, uh, these are classes of um, root, uh, root size categories, and uh, in the in, in and and this is so this is now the shoots of of each one of these. So these are these are actually these were taken from our from our foundation plant services block where we have th that's used for distribution of of of. Um, grafting wood or rooting wood. And so these are actual shoots of the rootstock here. These are the trunks of the rootstock and these are the roots of the rootstock. And so we saw these consistent differences again in all these parts of, of having uh, a, a greater number of, of large size vessels in the more, uh, uh, more vigorous rootstocks and, and a greater proportion of smaller size vessels in the in the more uh, dwarfing rootstocks, <clears throat> and uh, if you put all this together and calculate weighted, weighted mean vessel diameters, you see that uh, that consistently, well, fairly consistently at least, uh, the the Nemegard, regardless of whether you looked at the shoots, the trunks, or the roots, had the largest mean weighted mean vessel diameters. And the, the next one had the intermediate and the most size controlling had, had the next most or, or next smallest vessels. So it did seem to be directly related to vessel diameter and, and it, is seem, it does seem to be uh, as simple as just the, the anatomy of the, of the rootstock. And then when you calculate the, uh, he used this, these data 
uh, in vessel diameters, uh, weighted mean vessel diameters, and so on, to calculate the, the uh, theoretical xylem conductance based on the uh, Pisol law, which is basically the the, the uh, conductance or the resistance conductance through a vessel or a, a pipe is is a function of the of the radius to the fourth power. And 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 sure enough, it didn't matter what you looked at, Nemegard uh, had the highest uh, conduct the calculated theoretical conduct conductance, and the others fell in line. So we're fairly fa fairly certain that um, that we had a story here. But then we we also wanted to know whether uh, how much influenced because. There, there is the notion that the, the rootstock will influ influence the anatomy of the scion or vice versa. And so we did, we had a tree where we, uh, well, no, wait, this is, uh, yeah, so this is the scion, the, uh, a scion on, on each of the rootstocks versus the rootstock. And so this is, uh, and, uh, and so you see the scion was basically identical across when, when, when grafted on the three rootstocks, but the rootstock maintained their differences, just like we saw before. And, um, and this is the, the, the calculated hydraulic conductance of those, again, uh, showing that, that indeed the scion more or less stayed the same, and it was all in the rootstock. And then we happened to have some trees that where, we, where we would put, where he had put uh, controller nine as an enter stem. And we had O. Henry, which is a vigorous scion, and Nemegard was a vi vigorous rootstock. And uh, we looked at the theoretical hydraulic, we looked at the, the xylem vessel characteristics again in this combination with a, with a vigorous rootstock down in the bottom, uh, an interstem here, and a vigorous scion on top. And we looked at the uh, hy theoretical hydraulic calculated, well, we looked at the, he looked at the vessel sizes and the, all that, and calculated a weighted mean vessel diameter and all that, and then calculated theoretical hydraulic conductance, and sure enough, it came out that, that basically the, the, the most dwarfing rootstock, when used in an inner stem, had no effect in either direction on the, on the vessel diameter or vessel anatomy of, of, of the rootstock, of the others. Um, <clears throat> And then we had this series, you notice, uh, remember I, I talked about uh, we, had, we had four additional rootstocks that we released. So he looked at the anatomy, uh, the vessel characteristics of those four. And again, um, we saw that, that the, uh, the primary, the tri the primary uh, effect was on the, was, was on the roots and that it was in line with the, with the, with the, uh, the dwarfing characteristics. There was also, in this case, uh, uh, he looked at the trunks as well. So let me see here. So then we had a, I had a, uh, just last year, I had a, a, a geneticist breeder, a, a peach breeder who was in, interested in the peach rootstocks come from Brazil and he said, well, if that's the case, we should be able to figure out, we, if we're going to breed rootstocks in the future, it'd be really interesting if we could use this as a selection tool. But, it, but it's going to have to be simpler than, than what Tom Basie did, because Tom Basie, he looked at, he did a lot of calculations, very laborious and so on. So what this, so what uh, Claudia Bruckner did was he, he looked for some very simple characteristics that you could look at in doing cross section of, of shoots of these of these uh, different rootstocks, and he came up with with uh, the uh, the number of vessels around the largest vessel 
over the number of vessels of Nimagard. So, uh, so basically, he, he developed a, a simple selection criteria by which he felt, as, as a plant breeder, he would, he would uh, and then he tested whether he would be able to sort them out or not, depending on if he had a 10% or a 15% or a 20% sort of variance in, in the selection criteria. And he decided that, yes, he could certainly, he could certainly sort out the more size controlling rootstocks by having a quick, a simple, a simple assay like this. So, um, so he's hopeful that he can actually use this sort of information in his, in his rootstock breeding program. So and then we're going back to the beak bane uh, question. And how can xylem vessel diameter and theoretical hydraulic conductance of the outer rings of the xylem, which is what we measured, be limiting when there appears to be an excess of xylem capacity? In other words, why weren't Rogers and Beak Bain correct? Uh, so I've been troubled by this for, for actually quite a few years. And we did, until uh, Basie came back, we did this short experiment uh, a couple years ago. And uh, the, experiment, the experiment was basically we did girdling. So in California, for our peach production, especially early maturing peach production, it's actually quite common that, that we will, the grower will girdle the trees, which basically means you take a quarter inch ring of bark out uh, in the spring, six weeks before harvest, six weeks before your anticipated harvest, you take that, that ring of uh, bark off there down to the cambium, and then, and then um, that artificially holds the carbohydrates in the upper part of the tree, makes the fruit larger, and it makes it about three, three or four or five days earlier. And the tree doesn't die. I mean, contrary to all the stuff about girdling, the tree doesn't die. The, 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 if you only do that a quarter inch, uh, it grows callus across the girdle. And by, by the time of harvest, the girdle's mended again. The tree looks a little sick, but but it recovers, and you can do this year after year after year. So we did that, and we did two, two times of girdling, an early girdle and a late girdle. And our hypothesis was that, well, in most girdling, people assume that it's only the transport of sugars that's affected, not the transport of water. Okay? But we, were, we reasoned, well, we're not so sure. That, so this has been a, a conundrum in the girdling literature for years. Why shoot growth is actually usually shorter on girdle trees, uh, while fruit growth is larger, because uh, the fruit growth is larger because more carbohydrates held up in the tree. But why wouldn't uh, that excess carbohydrate in the tree stimulate shoot growth? So this is a problem. Uh, that's been banging around the literature for a while. So we did this experiment, and then we looked at the midday stem water potentials after girdling. So here's the early girdle. The midday stem water potential of the, of the early girdle uh, dropped significantly compared to the control. The controls, the, the, the triangles here. And then the late girdle, it, it dropped also relative to the control. But but both of them, both of them uh, sort of caught up again. So what's the interpretation here? Our interpretation is that, that uh, the girdling not only affected uh, flow and flow, it affected xylem flow because when you girdle, you're also hitting the cambium. So you're hitting the cambium, that's gonna stop the development of new, of new phloem. I mean, New Xylem for that period. So New Xylem uh, growth uh, stops. And so until it, until it rebounds, you see this effect. And, and there's also recently, in the last two or three, four years, there's mounting evidence that water transport trees in ring porous xylem with ring porous xylem relies pr pr primarily on the most recently formed ring of xylem maybe two rings of xylem. And in fact, 
Oh, th this is the this is the number of water sprouts per tree. Uh, it, it also affected the number of water sprouts per tree and, and so on. Uh, but uh, there, there are there is something published in the in the literature way back in 1890 that said that robinia, if you girdled a robinia, uh, some uh, at a particular time of the year the tree would die if you did this light girdle, whereas if, if you did it in the spring, but if you did it in the, in the fall, there was no effect. So this is sort of consistent with that. And, the, and, and, the, and the people that are doing the hydraulic conductance met, uh, with, the, with the probes, they're also finding that if you put the probe too deep, you, don't, you can't measure the hydraulic conductance nearly as well as if you, if you keep it in the outer layers of xylem. So there's increasing uh, recognition that it is the outer layer of xylem that's important. So this goes back to the rootstock thing, because if transport of the pl water transport in the plant is primarily uh, uh, dependent on the last year or the current year, new growing uh, xylem, as well as maybe the last year xylem, that's going to have an influence on having smaller vessels in the rootstock will have influence on the water potential of those plants. And so I think we have a story. So basically... The, the most recent ring then, is that current year's xylem? Well, obviously there's some movement in the previous year's xylem, but the, the efficiency of the current year's xylem is thought to be much, as it's developing, is supposed to be, is thought to be much higher than the previous year's xylem. And I think this varies by species, probably. Um, but anyway, so a summary of, of the way we think about this now is that of how the rootstocks, of the peach rootstocks work, is that the, di the diameter of the water conducting vessels of the dwarfian rootstock are smaller. This causes the hydraulic conductance of the rootstock and the water conducting tissue to be lower. This causes the water availability or water potential in the stems and leaves to be slightly less. This causes the elongation of stems to be slightly less and overall vigor of the tree is decreased over time and this is particularly true of the water sprout parts of the, the epicormic shoots. Uh, this decreases the amount of pruning needed. The decreased <coughs> pruning reduces the number of water sprouts uh, that are produced in the following year because if water sprouts are produced in response to pruning pretty much only. Uh, and this decreases the need for pruning even more. So you have a cumulative effect of l uh, less pruning. And this decreases the internal canopy shading and thus increases shoot quality and flower bud development. We, I don't show you data on that, but typically the bloom on the, on the size controlling rootstocks is much heavier than the bloom on the, dwarf, uh, on the vigorous rootstocks. Um, yeah. So uh, the question is, can we simulate this? So I've done a lot of work with uh, what we call the L peach model. It's a Linden, L stands for Lindenmeyer. It's a particular modeling language. And I'll just show you uh, uh, a movie of the simulation of, of, of the growth of two peach trees, one on, one on, a, on a vigorous rootstock and one in which the hydraulic conductance of the rootstock only is reduced by 50%. And so if we can get this to run. Um, out of this and then we'll click on the video. Let's see, Let's see, see, if, see if it'll... I might have to go out and I'll yeah, yeah, go out. We'll just just get this one. Okay, let me. Um, is there music with it too? By the yeah, way? there is. Okay. okay, so what we have here are three identical trees. Uh, the first uh, two years have already been simulated. So uh, the, the initial year in the nursery. And the first year, then, then in the nursery, after they've grown in the nursery for a year, they grow a they grow main stem. That's, that's in, in the way we grow to trees in California. That main stem is then hacked off at knee high, about. And then you, then you allow uh, uh, shoots to grow out of that. And then in the, in the 
summer, I mean the winter of the subsequent year, so after the trees are really two years old, one year in the orchard, uh, we, have, we have three types of pruning here. So it's exactly the same tree uh, simulated in each case, but there's three different types of pruning. This is what we call the Danuba pruning. Which is there's a group of growers, very conservative growers in the southern San Joaquin. They like to have all their trees to really just grow like heck in the, in the second year in the orchard. And so they prune them back to about a foot stubs or eight inch stubs, three scaffolds on uh, an, uh, an open base tree. This one's the same tree except it's sort of our standard recommendation. That is that you leave these, these scaffolds each to be about a meter long. Uh, and this is, yeah, anyway. Uh, and then we have what Scott Johnson and and Kevin Day and myself are sort of trying to promote is leaving the tree less hard pruned, selecting some of the fruiting wood off of here and so on, and then letting them go. So we have a simulation now, a movie, of, of this, this subsequent one year's worth of growth in this case uh, with, for, with music for your pleasure. Oh, I should say what we're doing. Uh, I forgot to explain what the model does. What the model does is basically uh, it grows the tree and while it's growing the, the growth of the tree is totally dependent on the carbon that's assimilated by the leaves of the tree. It basically si simulates the photosynthetic output of every single leaf and, um, and then, then that, that carbohydrate is distributed around the tree uh, according to the sink strength of all the individual organs that are on there. And then we have a whole bunch of uh, submodels in there dictating what, the, what individual shoots look like depending on if they're apicormic or proleptic or what have you. Uh, and um, so you'll see the differences between the three. These two are going to grow a little bit of fruit as well. So we have spring, it's blooming. If you look carefully, you see some green fruit in here that turn yellow. And we just had thinning there. So those in the front, you may have seen the fruit, some fruit disappear. It's simulating every hour of every day. And now you're going to see harvest here pretty quick. There's harvest. So, um, if you, um, I, don't, I, I should have stopped it, but the, the tree on the left that was really hard pruned ended up to be almost the same size as the tree in the center. And that's, and that's because, yeah, stop, there you go. So this tree ended up to be almost the same size as this one, and that's because by hard pruning like this, we grew almost exclusively epicormic shoots, which have no stop point. Epicormic shoots grow differently than, and this one has some epicormic, these really tall ones are the water sprouts that came out of these high heads, but there's many other shoots in here that are proleptic shoots. And this one, of course, had many, many more proleptic shoots. 
and still had a few epicormic shoots where we did a heading cut. So it sort of, it sort of explains how you can actually, these growers that do this are, are set on this because they get these very uniform trees. They have lots of choices for secondary scaffolds and everything. Um, whereas you do these and you have a little more random structure because you're not forcing as much growth. But it explains why these guys can be satisfied with this as compared to the traditional system because by the end of the season there's not that much difference. And that's really the way what happens in the field as well. Um, but you might, you, you, you would have noticed that there were more, more fruit obviously on these. And so many of our growers are going to less and less pruning because we're understanding this more and more. So I want to go back to the thing here. I can get out of this. Uh, back to this. But I'm not going to have to go all the way back. Oh no, here we are. Uh, so yeah, right there. So I, I want to acknowledge our collaborators on this project. It's, it's been basically uh, 25 years of work um, off and on. So f in terms of the development of the rootstock, uh, initial, the initial two, Dave Ramming was the USDA researcher. The material came from him. Scott Johnson, Kevin Day, and Jim Doyle, we did all of the field analysis. And then control, controller 6, 7, 8, and 9.5. Uh, Fred Bliss was a faculty member, but Ali Almedi was a technician of his that did almost m most of the work and these guys also have been helping. This is a graduate student. And then all of the physiology initially done by Weibo, and we had Boris Vasili from Italy, Jordi Marcel from Spain, Luis Solari from, he was a student from Uruguay, and two, two from uh, Italy, and one from Brazil. And then the modeling stuff, which I really just showed you a little bit about, and that's been sort of the main occupation of my mental, whatever mental stuff I have left. Uh, we, uh, David De Silva in the last uh, four years has been really instrumental in that as well as Romeo. Romeo Favreau uh, is a really interesting guy. He's about 86 now and he was working in our lab until a year and a half ago on a voluntary basis for about six years, eight years. Um, he was a computer scientist that was at the input, uh, at the very beginning of introduction of computers into the world, into, into commerce. He installed the, the first mainframe, com comu main, uh, frame computer in, in Europe back in the 50s, 60s. And then these two guys also worked on the model quite a bit. So I think that's it. Thanks for your attention. Exactly, girdle those trees. Uh, you mentioned that it's a month, I mean, uh, two weeks, a month before harvest. Oh, but you no, no, in that, no. In that so case, uh, we did it April, right? We did it. The first one was April, early April. April. The second one, I think, was late April, or early May. Okay. I think early. Yeah, I think late April. It okay. said it on the thing, but I yeah, yeah. Like it was the mark. Yeah, I just want to make sure. So you measure the. Uh, Midday stand. Keep in mind that our 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 bloom yeah. and our, a lot our spring is yeah. yeah. around <laughs> March 10 for for uh, these peach yeah. varieties. Yeah, with all that in mind, but do you think the new xylem development provides a significant you know provides significant amount of water to those plants? Let's say two weeks after the garden. That's my question. Apparently. Okay. Now we know that the xylem, the, the initial movement of sugars up the tree is all in the xylem. The yes. phloem is non-functional, so the initial movement of sugar up the tree in the spring is in the xylem, so there's got to be some functional xylem, there's no question about that. But apparently that, that new xylem that's being developed is more efficient, or is, that's our only interpretation. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is we look at we look at that water relations thing that we see, the difference in water relations, mm -hmm. it holds up until about the end of, end of June. If you measure the difference in water relations 
between trees on dwarfing rootstocks and, and vigorous rootstocks in July and August, there's, there's no significant difference in the, in the stem water potential, usually. Very difficult to detect one. And my interpretation now is that, um, is that the new ring of xylem is being formed, and, that's act and because it's that the vessels in that ring are smaller, that that is actually hindering the, the hydraulic conductance of that new shoot growth. And, and, the, and the growth of that tree for that, for that early part of the season. When, the, when you get adequate new rings of, of uh, uh, xylem, then you have enough vessels, even though they're smaller, to, to match the capacity of the, of the requirement of the top. That's, that's our interpretation at the present time. And do, do you? Has that been verified anatomically? Uh, we haven't. We haven't done that. We haven't done that. No. We, we should do that additional thing, looking at the actually the width of the design and calculate the total hydraulic capacity of, of, that, of the total ring. <coughs> what we did so far was just look at the new ring. All of, all that xylem stuff was related to the new ring, but only one section of the new ring. I mean, only a, a microscopic field view. My second question is, since the uh, dwarf me mechanism in peach uh, is primarily limitation on water transport, do you think uh, with the same rootstocks, will we see less dwarfing effect in New York versus California? How about its effect on fruit size? Because water is so important for fruit size. Uh, well, that's, I think, why we get the, the, the problem with, uh, with controller five. It has, it, it has small fruit. Uh, controller 5 was in the early earlier NC140 trial, mm -hmm. the national rootstock trial. Uh, the people in New York really liked it because for so some reason same. it has a higher uh, uh, cold tolerance. And that may be related to this vessel size too, I don't know. Yeah, it's more safer. Uh, yes. but, but the rootstock, but, but the fruit in California is, is too small to be an acceptable rootstock for commercial production in California. Now, controller six is the next step up, and it's a Carol Blood by Okinawa. One would think that it would have a, roots, a fruit size problem, but for some reason, and I'm not sure we don't understand why, uh, harvest is delayed a week with controller six. So we think that while it may have an inherently smaller fruit size if it's hard it's at the same time, because you add a week to it, it's able to make up uh, the, uh, a bit of the difference. And so it has acceptable fruit size. So we're quite excited. <coughs> I think actually that's, the, the other two are then getting close enough to Nemegar that it's very difficult to see a difference in fruit size. So, yeah. The observation has been made with Apple that if you grab an inner stem uh, into a three-part tree uh, and it's dwarfing inner stem, the degree of dwarfing would be proportional to the length of that inner stem. Right. Same in here. Same with this. I think the same. So, so apples and Muller nine. It's a more complicated story. But Laxo was one of the, the other people have reported it also. But Laxo and. Um, his student here, uh, early student. Anyway, they reported that Mauling 9 had, a, had a, a, a lower water potential. Trees on, cyan's on Mauling 9 had a lower water potential than, than trees on seedling or more bigger. <coughs> so that, was, that was published years ago already. Uh, but they sort of left it there. I think sort of in the same conundrum that Big Bang was in. And we were all in that. But the Mauling 9 is also different in that, that you have this lower growth, and there's signs of some sort of flowing compatibility or something going on in there as well. Uh, so I think that I think that is a more complicated rootstock situation. But what I think water is involved, but it's certainly not the whole story. Yeah. Um. You hear now and again that California might be having a drought issue on the news. And so I was just curious, 
given that you're conducting hydraulic studies, if you maybe had any special challenges in your research or something that you had, you know, that you have to kind of make amends for, or I just was kind of curious about that. Well, uh, yeah, we all have to make special things this particular year because water is on everyone's mind and salinity. What's, what's happening now is that the, the, so California has a very complicated water distribution system. All of the tradition, many of the traditional water districts on the east side of the San Joaquin Valley and the center of the valley, they, they all have these gravity, gravity fed irrigation districts. Uh, and, and many of those will be probably getting something like 40 to 60% of the normal allocation. The ones, the ones that are on the, the uh, and those are all local irrigation districts, more or less local irrigation districts. The ones that are on the federal irrigation or state irrigation projects, like the California Aqueduct, basically the, the water on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley and the water and that water continues to flow into LA. All of that's all of that's in, in, in the uh, California Water Project and. What happens with that water is it's basically water that's pumped out of uh, out of the delta before the delta runs into the the San Francisco Bay, so the water is fresh enough. It's pumped out of that up the hill and then and then reverse grab down the valley and then pumped a couple more times. Every time it gets too low, it pumped up higher again, flows. But that water, that water is is uh, uh, they're old. Well, most of the growers on that side are going to get zero of their allocation. Some of them twenty percent. So th those people are are the ones that are going to be really hurting. And and much of that land this year, the growers, um, some growers of permanent tree crop, also have. Uh, have annual crops, tomatoes, melons, whatever, usually, cotton. Most of them grow, if, they, if they're growing two types of crop on different pieces of land, most of them will, pl will not plant their annual, their annual crop and they'll use whatever water they can find to keep their perennial crop alive. Uh, and, and they'll do that largely by pumping the groundwater. But the problem in that area is the groundwater, depending on where you are, it can be very saline or quite saline. So right now at the moment everybody is flipping coins and drawing straws as to as to whether the lack of water is going to be the worst thing or whether the, sal sal the, the salinity of the water is going to be the worst thing. In, in, but, but for sure it's all going to be worse. There's, there's no doubt about that. And then up north in the, San Luis, in the Sacramento Valley there's also similar sort of water distribution comes out of the Sacramento River up. Uh, the, the rice growers, uh, there's a lot of rice in California, believe it or not, in this drought state. We have, we grow a lot of rice in the, in the, north, in the, in the Sacramento Valley. There will be a lot, some of that won't be planted, or people may plant, because those people will probably get 40 to 50 percent of their allocation. And so a lot of that, they will plant half their land and use the water from the whole allocation to to do the half of the land, something like that. Because the price of rice at the moment is really good. So there's, previously when we had, when we had a drought, a lot of the, the price of rice was really low. So those guys up there sold their water to the people down south. Because we have all these water conveyance systems, you can do that. There's a water market in California. Uh, but this year that probably won't happen much because uh, Agriculture in California, barring the drought, is is the most uh, lucrative that I've ever seen it in my in my 30 years. It's uh, 35 years of being at the university. All many crops are in high demand with high prices. And almonds, walnuts, and pistachios are 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 really the market is unbelievable. Yes. Alan had a question. Alan. Uh, yeah, I just 
I wanted to point out we got similar results as you mentioned with with Apple. Um, what we found was that at the top of the root stock, the dwarfing stock had a lower water potential, more stress. But then as you went out the branches, there was a decrease in water potential due to the friction. But that was the the uh, slope of that was the same regardless in the cyan. But what happened is when you got out to the uh, end of the branch, you had the same water potentials. But on the dwarfing stock, you got to the water potential with a one meter long branch. And with the uh, uh, more vigorous one, you started with a higher water potential, so it took two meters of growth to get to that same water potential where it stopped. Wow. So the, the outside of the trees all ended up with the same water potential, but it varied with the rootstock at the, big, at the uh, center of the tree. Really? We never we haven't looked at that down the chute at all. Was that with, with you and Bill? Yeah, Bill Oling. Yeah. Bill Oling. Yeah, okay. I, I hadn't remembered that part of the study. Yeah, study. I don't know that. Did you publish that part of the study? Uh, that was 30 years ago. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look for it. But that's okay. I usually just skim the papers for the stuff that I like to hear anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other questions, thoughts? All right. Nothing else? All right, I'll see you tonight, Alan. Okay. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.